Yep, oh, I'm on now. Hi, welcome to DevOx. 2016, I guess. I've never been to Antwerp before, so I'm getting a, a good dose of non-California weather. H had as much uh, uh, cold and drizzle as I'm uh, um, prepared to have here. So, um, not your father's von Neumann machine, right? Crash Course in Modern Hardware. I gave this talk like six years ago, and then I went back through the slides recently to, to do it for DevOps here, and the answer is um, not much actually has changed in the six years in terms of the hardware. A lot has changed under the hood, um, but it's mostly and not where you were hoping, or not where we used to get it. So, you know, the, the, the classic von Neumann architecture is there's, you know, programming, stored memory, memory shared between programs and data, sequential execution model, one instruction, then the next, and the next, and the next to get your problem done. Great model for thinking about algorithms. Um, it's not actually how computers work today. Um, it did used to be that way. So it's a nice abstraction. Um, it's, it's a good enough abstraction that that's what we always typically think about. Um, until you start getting into like real multi-core, multi-threaded kind of situations, or you're trying to get performance out, and you don't understand why your code is slow. And so I'm going to dive under the hood and look at what goes on in modern hardware, and then map it back to what it means to your programming model. So the, the chart on the left is one I did six years ago. The chart on the white is one I did last week. And, and the scale, the, the, what, the metric I was using is a little bit different, but it's a log scale, so it's all sort of doesn't matter. Um, and what I can see here is that since you know, 2004, 2005, um, throughput per core has gone up about 10% a year. So in the last eight years, we've got roughly a doubling in performance uh, on a single thread. Now, we've got a lot more threads. We've got a lot more cores. But any individual core is only a little bit faster in the last decade. And that brings up a different model of performance. You can't write sequential code on a bigger and bigger and bigger problem and have it solve it just by waiting to the next faster machine. You actually have to write parallel code. You have to think about it that way. And if you have performance problems, you're trying to diagnose what's going on with them. Um, what has happened is that the, what, what is important to performance has changed a lot in the last uh, 20 years. And it's not necessarily what people think it is. So let's dive in a little bit and, and roll back the clock. 1988, um, people were using CISC ISAs. Why? Because they were meant to be written by humans. People were writing their programs in assembly still. Um, and then they had compilers, yes, and they used a lot of compilers, but used a lot of assembly. And the, the CISC approach was, you know, dated from like 10, 20 years earlier when the expectation was you would write it in assembly and compilers were this newfangled thing that you might experiment with as opposed to the other way around. Um, so you had these very exotic hardware primitives that we would now only ever put in a library. Things like uh, string pattern matching or polynomial evaluation were actual machine hardware instructions on a VASC, VASC of that era. Um, multiple level of memory and directions per instruction. Um, it made it very easy to program mentally, very hard to program in hardware to make the hardware go faster. I mean, that led to a real problem with uh, uh, performance as you went forward. But at the time, the, the cycles per instruction, the speed, was basically dominated by page faults. Right? So, so you knew how many clock cycles were on an instruction. You could just look at it, and you could add them all up, and you got a number. But if you missed a page fault, you had to swap to disk really slow. Um, locality was important because you had to fit everything in a small amount of RAM, and every time you touched disk, you, you sucked. So you tried hard to get your code to co-locate, and the linker mattered, and overlay linkers, and crap like that. Um, but performance was basically you know, get rid of page faults, and then count instructions. Then we had this you know, grand flip to risk processors for exactly the 50% a year I'm mentioning there. For about 15 years, processors got 50% faster per year. Um, and that was simply because we went to simpler processors and people could begin to think about how to make the hardware go faster. A lot of it was done with better pipelining, but it was a lot of transistor shrinkage turning into higher clock rate as well. Um, the ISAs became more difficult to code by hand. People still would write assembly code in small amounts now, though, for all kind of wrappers or special instructions, video codecs, audio codecs, things like that. But you weren't thinking that you would ever write your entire app in assembly, of course not. You wrote your app in C, or later Java, but, but assembly was reserved for pulling out funny special custom instructions, and rarely for hot code like the codecs. Um, 
memory got a lot cheaper. You got a lot more of it. You, page faults quit really mattering. You, you could run a machine out of memory and page fault yourself to death, but you had to try now. The default answer was you didn't suffer enough page faults that you actually cared. So you, you kept getting faster and faster until we hit almost at the same time a bunch of different speed walls. Power wall. Power goes up as a cube of frequency. So if you raise your frequency a little bit, your power raises up by a lot. Well, if you get more power into the chip, you got to get it out of the chip, or eventually the chip just melts, right? Just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. So, you know, people had these grand theories that, you know, next year Intel's 10 gigahertz processor would have the chip hit the, you know, temperatures equal to the surface of the sun. And you just do the cube law and you say, oh my God, it's going to be, you know, going to blaze like a, like a thermal storm or something. And then you hit this um, ILP wall, instructions, uh, um, you know, overlap, parallel instruction execution law uh, um, wall, which was, which was basically, you know, Intel was the king of brainiacs. There was the speed demon versus brainiac wars. I don't know if anyone remember those. Um, Intel was the, was the champion of the brainiac approach, and they hit a wall. They, they couldn't get more performance out by being smarter with how they executed instructions, although they tried very, very hard. And then, you know, memory got no faster. Um, it kept getting bigger, kept getting more bandwidth, fatter pipes, but the pipes weren't quicker. And that was some of it was just simply speed of light. Their distance between the memory chip and the processor is, you know, this, or whatever, right? Okay, well, you know, Cray came along and said, well, you know, nanosecond is a foot. So if you're this, you're half a nano just for speed of light. But you still actually had to, you know, raise voltages and drop voltages in a way that you could count, and you couldn't actually hit speed of light. So whatever fraction you got... Um, that distance mattered, and it wasn't getting any shorter, and it was the laws of physics. You just couldn't make that better. So memory got no faster. Um, and so now you couldn't, you, you just had to, you know, if you needed something from memory, and it wasn't available on the processor, it was over there, you had to go get it. And then it, that was just going to take the long, length of time that it did. So clock rates are flat for the last 15 years or so. And you can get slightly faster by paying a lot of money and putting giant coolers on it, but that's sort of the limit. Instead, we started getting more cores, lots more cores, so, so not faster. And then the question comes, you know, what is the performance model now when I go get my next grand x86? How do I think about making my, my program run faster? Um, and, and you have to think about, okay, I need to do parallel execution. And then, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll go through today here is what that means in terms of coding style. Um, and then there's a, the other major performance model we have to take away is that you're going to be cache miss dominated and you have to count cache misses. You don't count page faults, you don't count instructions, you count cache misses. And that means you count le levels of indirection. So we'll, we'll cover that here and more. So let's look through what ILP meant. This is the Brainiac approach to speed and where it went, and, and then I'll give you an example of where it died, where it stopped getting better, right? So a bunch of techniques were used to get uh, instructions to execute faster, most of which were actually done to not raise the clock rate, but instead were done to allow parallel execution. So instruction level parallelism. Um, each instruction that you run on a piece of you know, mini modern hardware um, actually takes more than one clock cycle. People think, ah, I got a three gigahertz clock, I get one instruction per clock. No. Instead, instead, the instructions all take some variable count, but four to 10, something like that. And then you pipeline. And pipelining means you lay one on top of another on top of another as fast as you can. And that works as long as the instructions are all independent from each other. So here's a little tiny instruction, set of instructions. You'll see me do a lot of x86 assembly here. Um, so just, I'm just sort of faking it, but this works on every processor, including ARMs and powers and, and all kinds of embedded systems that are inside your, your phone will have you know, a low power Intel, a low power ARM, plus several DSP chips doing all kinds of fun stuff. They all look roughly the same here. So um, on an early machine, this would be four clocks. I mean, I worked on a Z80 chip and that was, was four clocks. Um, Pipelining makes them appear like they're one clock because you start to add on one clock cycle in my bottom picture here. One clock later, the add has gone instruction fetch. You begin the instruction fetch for the compare while you decode the add. Then you grab the register and you take the 16 and you run through the adder unit and you get a write back to you know, RBX of plus 16 in the last clock. Meanwhile, the, the comp is one instruction, one clock cycle behind all the way down the pipe. So pipeline is very common. It's been done for a very long time. All CPUs these days do it. So it improves throughput but not latency, which means it works great until you have instructions that depend on each other. 
So the, the deeper the pipeline, the theoretically the higher the effective CPI you can go because you can get more and more and more instructions running in parallel. Um, the, the major gain from RISC CPUs over the older CISC ones was exactly this. The simpler pipelining, the simpler instructions allowed better pipelining, deeper pipelining, uh, and, and simpler pipelining where you could tell whether you had a dependency or not with much fewer gates and instruction, uh, hardware, and that let you run the clock rate up as well. So along the way, you lost the multiple memory ops per instruction. You can only do one memory cycle on any given instruction. It's either load or store, but it's not some random blend of both or several loads or whatever. And then some ops never, never got pipelined or didn't get pipelined uh, until very recently or to not such a great depth. Integer division and many floating point ops were very slow to get pipelined. And that meant that they had greater uh, latencies there. So the, the, the major conflict is that you have some sort of CPU resource you have a conflict between. And it causes a, a pipeline stall or hazard. The obvious one being where y you have to fetch a value from memory before you can use it to do something useful. Um, in the old days, that would cause a, a, a pipeline stall uh, and maybe even a complete pipeline flush. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But a pipeline flush on a modern x86 is like a 30 clock cycle uh, delay. And if you're counting clock cycles, that adds up pretty fast. So when does that happen? It happens when you mispredict. When you mispredict, when you're walking through, for instance, a large, complicated uh, uh, data structure, we have to make a decision at every point, such as uh, any sort of you know, B-tree style lookup. You know, if you're predictable at the first few layers, you're almost always not predictable further down in. And then what looks like a, this should be really fast, it's just load compare branch, load compare branch. It's 30 clocks a pop, and suddenly it takes you know, hundreds of nanos, you get into micros, to do a lookup. And if you're trying to do anything fast, that's going to add up really quick. So the, the, the major thing that happened, though, was cache misses. So a cache hitting load. So here's a load instruction. I'm going to go fetch from some address in RBX and put the result into RAX. So if I hit in my cache, usually I'm talking about L1 hit, it's a couple clock cycles, two or three. But if I miss, and I have to go all the way out to main memory, it's possibly 200 to 300 clock cycles. So you see a 100x variation in the execution time of that load instruction. So it matters a whole lot to know whether or not this is going to hit reliably or not in any sort of, sort of hot performance loop. But one of the key themes here is that I may not have my value in RAX available to me for hundreds of clock cycles. Um, the, 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 the hazard cost for this, or the hazard, uh, the way you handle it, um, on simple CPUs, you might stall until it shows up. This would be true for instance for GPU, but many program, uh, many uh, uh, CPUs will run on until the value is needed. So commonly you can do execution while RAX is unknown of the dot 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 instructions in the middle. And when it comes to a point where you have to use it, then you stall, and that lets you get a chance to do some work in the miss shadow, in the, in the cache miss shadow. It does tie up the load store unit, which is pending, holding on to the memory bus, waiting for things to come back. Um, but it's a really common speed up. It lets you work over a cache miss. Um, most modern CPUs of, a, of any you know, level of complexity will have this, including most of your DSPs will, will have that much brains in them. Um, the next thing people discovered was branch prediction. And so branch prediction is one where you don't know yet how, which way the branch will go, so you're going to make a prediction. Here I don't know what the result of the compare on racks is because the value hasn't come back from memory. So I'm going to make a guess. It turns out that for many branch instructions, I can guess highly reliably, 95% of the time easily. right? And if I'm right, I can carry on and start issuing the next instructions. Of course, if I'm wrong, i got a giant mess to clean up. And this gets into the mispredict penalty. For instance, I have a store instruction coming up. Should I execute the store prospectively? What if I do? Do I write memory? And then I have to clean it up if the branch mispredicts? OK, I can't do that. Um, because some other core CPU might see that write, which is not supposed to happen. So I put the store off into a store buffer, and I pinned it, and I make more and more things sort of pending behind the branch misses. And maybe I want to have several branch uh, predictions in a row. And if any of them fail, I have to unwind. But since I'm 95% right, maybe I get them all right. And then, the, then I get to go faster. So it's a, it's a fantastic way to speed things up. Um, it's, ooh, look at that mouse wandering around here. 
Um, it was been done for a long time on a lot of cores. And then we get into the wide issue or multi-issue. Um, and here you might get multiple instructions done on a clock, and your cycles per instruction would keep dropping as you can execute a whole lot of things in, in one clock cycle. And again, you have all the same constraints of data contention or misprediction or whatever, um, and, and even more speculative executions required, but it, it, it actually still commonly applies. So here I have this set of instructions that are unrelated, so I could wide issue them both. Same clock cycle for both ops when they start. They're going to read and write unrelated registers. I have to tech, check that, and that's a quadratic uh, uh, operation as I add more instructions to the issue, um, but dual issue is common on almost all CPUs, except on the most simplest embedded ones, or like the GPUs might not do dual issue. And then you get more complicated stuff, so registry naming, the branch prediction, speculation, out-of-order execution, they're all synergistic. They allow you to continue forward progress uh, in, in, the, in the face of various kinds of hardware stalls and cache misses and mispredicts. Um, the, the register renaming lets you store all your output results of all these instructions uh, sort of speculatively, like, I'm hoping this is what value I want to store into RAX, but I, I don't know yet. And if I'm right, I will then take this extra register and call it RAX and say, hey, that's the actual machine register state. Um, and if I'm wrong, I'll just throw that thing away uh, and, and do something else for RAX. So this was a great way to let you execute further and further and further sort of into the unknown, into I don't know what the value is going to come back from memory, I don't know how this branch is going to predict, but if I'm right, then I have this all ready, all this execution is ready, and I'll just take it and go on to the next step. So really the goal here has shifted from just run more instructions to get to run until I can start the next cache miss, because the cache misses are totally dominating. So let's go through this. Here's, here's an example, it's a little bit bigger. I'm going to load an instruction. Let's pretend this is the one that misses from memory. It's 300 cycles to get it back. So I want to do something for that length of time. So I'm going to do another instruction. And I'm going to wide issue, so I'm still on clock zero. And I'm going to, uh, uh, it's an unrelated register read, uh, read and write. And I'm going to, uh, you know, continue going forward. Now I'm using register renaming because the first instruction is reading RBX and the second one's writing it. It's reading it and writing it. The output can't collide with what the load store unit's using on input, but I got register renaming going on, so that's all good. Then I want to do this one, and I'm going to attempt wide issue again because I'm an x86 and I can do quad issue. Um, I don't have my flags, so I have to wait for this instruction until the flags come back from the RAX. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, speculatively know that the flags are, are well, I'm going to know the flags are unknown. So when I get to this one, I'm going to have to branch predict. But my branch prediction is pretty good, so I'm going to pretend I get it right, and now I'm limited to my forward execution. I want to start another clock cycle. So now I'm speculative. So I don't know what that branch is going to do. But on the next clock, so I do a store into a store buffer. And why do I do a store buffer instead of in my cache or in my memory? Because it might not actually be there. So the store buffer is a holding spot for an unknown uh, uh, store instruction, like a instruction that might not execute. And I can throw it away, and it doesn't update my cache if I throw it away. Um, could be also that RBX here turns into null after that add, and I should throw a TLB fault too. But I'm going to pretend that it doesn't. I'm going to write the address and the value into my store buffer and carry on. Now that was a load store unit, and let's pretend I can only do one of those a clock cycle. So I'm on to another clock cycle now. I have another cache miss that I'm going to start execution on. And now I have two cache misses running to memory, also at 300 clocks, and the load store unit's busy again. And so I come down here to this last instruction, which needs RIX to even start the load for the next one. It needs the prior load to get the next one. So I'm pointer chasing. One pointer has to get from memory. It's missing. I need that first pointer before I can even begin getting the second pointer. So what happens? In four clock cycles, I started seven ops, got two cache misses running. They're going to come back in cycles 300 and 302. So I had seven ops in 302 clock cycles. The, the miss is totally dominate. And this is the normal case now. You're on a modern processor. It's cache miss to cache miss. That is your performance. Count your cache misses. Don't count your instructions. So now you have to know what pieces of memory you're touching to know how fast your code goes. Every time you add that new capital I integer, you pick up a level of indirection. Every time you added a hash table wrapped around a, a you know XML, wrapped around a JSON, wrapped around whatever, Every level of indirection is what kills you. 
Okay. So looking back at how this all worked out, Intel decided that it was having trouble with the Brainiac, so they, they, they tried a billion dollars on titanium to mine out static ILP, which looked great in theory. Um, assuming you had infinitely wide machines with infinite number of registers and cache misses possible and infinite amounts of speculation. And the answer came back is that actually didn't work. Um, the limits of compiler knowledge prevented you from doing all kinds of optimizations that were necessary to get the actual count of parallel infinite cache misses running in parallel. So it, it worked well on some narrow set of domains and just did not work out well on anything outside of that. In particular, things that look like Java or JavaScript just suck badly. Whereas the x86 successfully mined ILP for about 15 years, just an incremental addition of performance hacks, ever deeper pipelines, ever wider issue, more parallel dispatch, giant reorder buffers, lots and lots of functional units, um, you know, 120 instructions in flight. I think these days they, they'll support 10 parallel cache misses in flight, um, but they're hitting the limits. Limited by cache miss rate and branch miss predicts. Both miss rates are really low, but a miss will cost you, you know, 300 clocks and a four wide issue. Miss costs you 1,200 instructions issued. So a 5% miss rate completely dominates. So basically, ILP got mined out. Um, people kept throwing more and more transistors at it, and it, the extra transistors were not helping enough, and Intel's actually backed off from that a little bit, and they don't do quite so aggressive uh, now. Instead, they're, they're headed for the lots more cores. We kept getting more and more transistors. You know, whatever Moore's law means, it, it still means you get more transistors um, so what do you do with them? Well, if you try to get a little more wider issue, a little bigger caches, a little better branch prediction, you don't get that much performance because those are basically mined out. <clears throat> so they went to the, the, the multi-core solution. Let me look a little bit at memory because that is the dominant cost. Um, I didn't update this chart, but it hasn't changed very much either. So basically, there, there's an exponentially widening gap in performance, and it's slowed down in the, in the years since, but the gap between CPU performance and memory remains at this constant, very large amount. Memory since then has gotten uh, uh, wider, more bandwidth, but the latency has not improved substantially. It's still hundreds of clock cycles to get from cache miss into your CPU core to do something. So cache miss is still completely dominate. Uh, I'm going to touch this really quickly. Um, I hope everyone knows there is an SRAM and a DRAM in the world. SRAM is the fast but expensive version. This is what all your caches lo look like on the low-level caches in your x86. Uh, DRAM has a lot more, uh, a lot fewer transistors, and, and because it has fewer transistors, it's a lot denser. You get a lot more cache out of it, and main memory is also done this way, but the, the, the lack of transistors means that they bleed. Uh, 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 voltage out over time, and you have to refresh it. So it has more complications to using it in the hardware, and some more variation in performance, and a lot more density, and a lot more density is what people are looking at, but it doesn't get any faster. You can't jam power into DRAM to have it come out faster, because it doesn't have enough transistors for that. You have to very carefully read this one transistor's little storage of power, and then put it back when you're done. Whereas in SRAM, you can keep smashing power in until you melt the chip and get things to go faster. Yeah, people use both, um, and that's because uh, uh, the closer you are to the CPU, the faster you go, and that's the speed of light, but the, 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 you, know, you need to be faster to keep up with the CPU, so you use the SRAM close, but it's not very dense, you can't have much of it close, or you run out of chip space. So you end up with a, a blend of them both, and it's all down to like speed of light and, and wire delay. I talked about it before, you know, here, here's, here's a nanosecond. A speed of light. Well, in copper on you know your PCB board substrate, you know it's nanoseconds smaller and smaller, and suddenly you're in multi nanos to go get it. Um, so from there, let's look a little bit about what what happens here with uh, caches and why they matter the way they do. So the um, as people got faster and faster CPUs, they kept adding cache layers where the, the registers, let's see, registers on the CPU core, the orange part there, would basically be, be one clock, but wide issue, so a quarter clock, if you like, you know, less than a clock cycle to get out of register. An L1 cache hit, we're only about three clock cycles in latency. Um, an L2 is 10 to 15, it kind of varies, 
but that's the rough order of magnitude, where main memory is maybe 300 clock cycles away. And you end up sharing caches. So typically, there is a uh, lowest level shared cache, which these days is an L3, or it used to be an L2, or even an L1. Um, and then below that is memory, and the L3 cache is guarding the, the cores uh, from memory if they're able to share amongst themselves. And then the L1 and the L2 are typically private per core. But with the high memory latency, you know, the ILP is not actually helping all that much because you're just stuck behind the cache misses. And, and you know, one of the ways to think about it is that because of the giant gap between the CPU and the memory speed, the, the, not only the cache misses dominate, it, it's essentially memories like, you know, the old disk, right? If you page faulted, that was your dominant cost 20 years ago. These days, if you cache miss, that's your dominant cost. What can you jam in your L1 cache? That's where your performance goes. As soon as you're in L2, it's, it's still OK. When you get past L3, your performance is going to fall off by 10x. So in an effort to make things go faster with memory, people started relaxing coherency constraints. And x86 went back and forth on this a little bit. And then they stabilized out at a very, uh, uh, a very conservative model. And various hardware vendors have tried uh, more aggressive models to get more performance out. And it does work up to a point. And I'll step people through it. But what I'm going to show you today will actually also happen on an x86 in just the exact same way. And it's a standard problem you have that everyone knows, like double check blocking kinds of things and the lack of a volatile keyword. So let's look at what really happens here. Because with the, these you know, complex programming models where each core is doing its own thing and has its own view of the world, the order of execution is relative to the observing CPU. You know, shades of Einstein here, uh, your view is it's relative. Different CPUs will see the world in a different way. And that's because they're physically separate devices. So here's my little fake multi-core. It's too simple by an order of magnitude, maybe two. I'm showing one level of cache with just two cache lines. But in reality, of course, there's many cache line layers. Each one tends to be about 10x bigger and 10x slower than the cache level before it. The main issue here is that data will be replicated. There's no single home location for the data. I think, oh, I have this flag value. I've got it in memory somewhere. No. Flag value exists in memory, yes, but it exists in your caches as well, and maybe in your registers at some point. Right? And because it exists in multiple places, there's a time and a space for it to come out of sync with each other. And we'll get into that in a second. The caches have to talk to each other through some protocol. Here I'm using a very simple one, but actual protocols are a lot more complicated. This one's just modified, exclusive, shared, and valid. Where I have an I on the right of the lines that have all dashes, it's invalid. This cache line holds no data. S for shared, meaning the flag of zero is shared. Its value is known to be correct in both memory and that cache, and maybe in other caches as well, but not in this case. Same for data on the right. <coughs> and then last thing is know that memory controller and memory, it's not a first in, first out, simple, I just ask for a value and get it, ask for a value and get it. No, it supports lots of parallel cache misses. And the time to return a value varies a lot according to what the hell the memory controller is doing at the moment. So it could be that some things come back fast, some things come back slow. They get reordered inside the memory controller all the time. The memory controller is doing a best effort throughput. It's not doing a, a FIFO simple sort of thing. Now here's my little program, classic uh, double check read kind of problem. I have some sort of initializer I run once, which sets some value to data, sets a flag to true, saying the data is available. And then a bunch of threads want to read it, and they test the flag. And if it's not set, they do something, probably initialize it. But if it's set, hey, they can go grab the data. And the data is immutable at this point, and they're all happy, and they get their value. So this is like a, a good, fast way to have multiple threads where you initialize a value once. Except I forgot the volatile keyword. So where's the bug? Well, how does this bug work? So the initial values here, my caches, flags are all zero, but you notice it's replicated in a few places. I'm going to run the Java code, you know, if not flag. And the hardware instruction for it is load into racks from the address of flag. So my CPU number one, right, the green guy, says, oh, I want to know what the value racks is. I don't know. So I'll flag it as in flight. I'm trying to get racks. I'll go to load store unit and say, give me the contents of flag. So that heads down to the cache layer in a clock cycle. It says, go to the cache, give me the contents of flag. So that cache knows that he wants the value of flag, and he doesn't have it. But if he's going to get a copy, he needs to get a copy from memory, because that's where the, the golden copy is. 
When he gets a copy, if somebody else has written the flag, they need to flush that value out. So he sends out an invalid to the other caches. If you're holding onto a copy of flag, you should write your copy to memory, because I want to have a copy. I don't want to have the latest copy. So he sends out an invalidate, which comes back in a minute with everyone saying, we don't have a special copy of flag. We just have the shared one. That's all fine. Meanwhile, CPU number one is back around to, hey, let's go branch on the contents of racks. Is it equal to zero or not? Well, I don't know. It's not back from memory yet. So I'm going to predict. And now, in, under my speculation, I'm going to go speculative execution. I'm going to go load the value of data into RBX. OK, that means I have to go to the memory controller and ask for data. So I send all question off to memory controller. Please, Mr. Memory, Mr. L1 cache, tell me the value of data. Meanwhile, down at the memory controller, there's a request for the value of flag finally hit there. Um, and that will go on for a long time. So I, I show it in the memory controller, but it's probably physically in the wires because it takes several clock cycles to move just into the wires before it's onto the chip in the memory controller and it can begin to figure out where the hell the value for flag is. Meanwhile, my other core begins to do something. It writes a value into racks and then stores it. Well, the store is going from the CPU to the L1 cache. At the same time, the other CPU is asking for the value of data. Here's my true data race. Two physically different devices. They're separated on the die by you know, millimeters, not a huge distance, but they are physically separate. So these two things aren't aware of each other. One is writing it, one is asking for it. So the guy that's writing it says, hey, you should invalidate your copy if you have one, because I'm about to write the golden value. But it's too late. The first CPU, CPU number one, has already grabbed the value for data that he had in his cache. So then the acknowledge comes back, yeah, I flushed it. And the cache on the right lost his value of data. He's going to have to fetch it again, some future value from the golden value in, in memory. But the value he had was valid at the time he had it, and he handed it off to RBX. So RBX has a speculative value of zero. And the invalidate comes back, and the write happens into my you know, L1 cache, and the state is changed to modified because I have the golden value of it in my cache. There is a state of it in memory still, and that's because these devices are physically separate. They're both talking about the same thing, the value of data. One is in my cache, one is in memory on a different chip on the same motherboard. Um, they have different values, and that's normal. This is the, this is the, you know, it's all relative kind of thing. Depends on who's, who's asking, who's looking. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's in two places, and the value is relative to the observer. Should L1, uh, CPU1 uh, immediately look at memory? He can't. It's not fast enough, but if he could, he could find the zero there, but he can't. Um, and meanwhile, CPU0, if he looks, he'll find it in his L1 cache and see one, two, three. So the two different CPUs are going to disagree in what it looks like. And then finally, CPU number zero writes out the new value for flag, saying, hey, initialization's done. So Mr. CPU one, invalidate your copy of flag if you have one. You don't. It's all fine. So I write my one. I'm modified in CPU zero. I get the acknowledge back from CPU one's cache saying, yeah, I don't have a copy of flag. And the write hits the memory controller for data one, two, three. And I'm still trying to get that flag value out of memory controller, by the way. I haven't got it yet. And that's because the memory controller is doing what the hell it can, but it's behind. It's got 20 other, you know, Pending cache misses is trying to resolve at the same time, and the flag thing is just in the best effort bin. Along comes a write from CPU number zero of the flag value. What well, hits the memory controller? At that time, the memory controller can say, wait, wait, wait. I don't want to go out to my DRAM. It's really slow. I just got written on these bus lines. Hey, here's the new value for flag. So here you go. Answer. Flag. So I'm going to send it back. So the flag value goes up to CPU number one's cache. It goes up into CPU number one's registers. OK, I, I matched my speculative execution. Flag was, in fact, one. So speculative execution must have been OK. So I'm going to carry on. I'm going to take this value I got in RBX for data and use it. Well, the answer is it's not an address. It's null. It's stale, whatever. It was the wrong thing. Crash and burn, right? So real trips really reorder stuff. And the answer is. You have to think about this stuff now, because we have to do multi-core to get performance out. So we hit this limit of diminishing returns for having speculative, out of order, cache coherency protocols, everything, you know, branch prediction, all that stuff. 
Um, we went to risk and, and started out simple, and now it got very complicated as well. And it's the same issue. We're not able to get more performance out of a single core anymore. Um, so we still have the transistors, but burning them on a, an ever bigger cache or an ever smarter branch predictor isn't actually effective anymore. So we're still, you know, we're into the land of chip multi-core, and it's just that concurrency is a hard problem. Um, there's been a chip multi-threading thing that's actually very common, but it has the same issue. So this is like very old now, Niagara. Like who remembers Niagara, right? But this is actually true on all x86s with hyper-threading. It's the same idea. And that's having the same piece of hardware act like it's got multiple cores um, on the one CPU, and they're going to switch which core they're pretending to run, which logical core, on the same physical hardware if you have a stall. And it's just an efficiency hack, but it has every bit the same problem as things we've done here before. And you get to have more, uh, more thread of execution that are unrelated, and so they can get more cache misses that are unrelated. They're not dependent on each other, going in parallel. And that's the reason why you might want 10 in parallel instead of 2. Um, but it, 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 the same limits are hit, and that's because it, it, any one core can't get more than two or three cache misses running in parallel before it needs a value of a cache miss to go on to the next step. So what's this mean? You know, the dominant operation has changed over the years. It used to be page faults, then it was just count of instructions. Multiplies were expensive, and loads were cheap. I don't know if anyone remembers that day. Now, now multiplies are cheap, and loads are expensive. And then cache misses. And now the cache misses didn't go away. It's the same problem. But you get a lot of cores. And you have to use them to get your performance to go up to the next level. And that means you have to think about how to handle, how to write code in a multi-core era. Um, I think I've said this enough times already. Let me, let me pound this one, though. It's the data indirections that kill you. This is where your performance goes. And so the way to think about this is to look at your data structures and how you're laying them out. And look for where places where you've added wrappers on wrappers on wrappers that you can get rid of. You remember back in the day, the buffer copy was bad. And then you know 80s era OSs, people went to zero copy. Zero copy network stacks. It was a pain in the butt to get it right. But it was that copy that hurt you. And now it's whatever layers you're using between each of your major data forms. Every time you run through a conversion, you end up burning through all your data, and it, it doesn't fit in your cache. So you, you have to reload it all from memory again and again and again. And that's where the cost goes. Don't touch it, the data if you can't help it. Don't have indirections if you can help it. So one of the ways you can get away from having indirection um, is to look at data that's uh, immutable and, uh, uh, and then sharing, and then flattening those data structures out. So shared data is easy to, to, to run fast because it runs in your caches. And it's actually OK to mutate data on a single core because it's going to run fast in your L1 caches. And as soon as you're both shared and mutable, you have a really hard concurrency problem to work out. And you have a really hard performance problem to work out as well. Um, and that turns into uh, uh, all kinds of issues with requiring synchronization, which can be both very slow and, and expensive as well. So it, 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 if you can figure out how to write your data where it's immutable when you share it, your, your life is much better, because everyone will have it in their caches, the shared copies. And it, you'll get the cache, miss, the cache hits and run out of cache instead of run out of memory. As soon as you start mutating it, you have a horrible problem. All right, um, let's see, wrap this up here. Yeah, chip multi-threading. It looked like a great idea. This is an old slide. I should throw it out now. It, it, it does its uses. It has its uses, but it's not really any more effective than just having another core. You still have to program to the core, and it still gets no more throughput as a regular core. So one of the things that came out of this was that CPU utilization tools often have, they're often misleading. So if you look at your perf bar, and it shows you're pegged, um, your CPU's busy, what is it doing? Well, you don't know, and what you don't know is where the performance is going. So what's missing these days is cache utilization tools, bandwidth tools. If you're running out of cache, your working set doesn't fit in your cache. It looks like your code is just all slow, but you don't know what fast or slow is, so it's all that speed that it is. But 
it could be that your working set's just too big, and there's a smaller working set, usually by getting rid of layers of indirection and layers of wrappers, that lets your data get denser and fit in your cache. Then everything goes faster. It's, it's, uh, and there aren't any good tools to tell you that you're out of bandwidth, for instance, that you're really stuck behind, unable to fetch stuff from memory fast enough. So the summary here is that the damn things are really moving, really complicated beasts with lots of moving parts under the hood. There's lots of internal parallelism to make things go faster. The performance model has flipped around until now it's basically cache misses. Um, and unless you profile fairly deeply, fairly intelligently, you just don't know where the, you know, the, the, the low level performance goes. And then this premature optimization is the root of much evil. It really is. It's, this is a game where to understand where the performance goes, it really helps to understand your code very clearly. And that in turn means actually having some simpler code and then backing up for a second and saying, what are we doing? Why are we touching this data in the first place? Can we not touch it? And that will lead you down the path of, OK, what is actually we're trying to accomplish here? And this is how we can think about performance. And then once you can get to you know, the clarity there, you, you can simplify your data structures, simplify the code goes with it, and you'll get your performance out. And, and that's it. So I got 10 minutes or so for questions. Yeah. So, right, wouldn't the easy solution be to increase the cache size? So the answer to that one is, is it's been tried and tried and tried, and people have increased the cache sizes sort of perpetually every year, and then they hit this point of diminishing returns. So exactly the issue is that the cache hit rate kept climbing, 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 and then it hit like 95%. So you double it, and, and, and you don't go to 100%, you go to 95.5%. And then you look at you know, what you got out of the doubling, which is a tiny amount of extra performance. So you could throw an entire extra core in. So you look on a modern x86, it's like 90, 95% cache. It's already almost entirely cache. You cannot double the cache size anymore. There's no physical die space for it. So you're already as big as cache as you can get. And there's no more performance to be had by getting your cache bigger. Yeah, are there any tools in Java that does do this? Um, I don't know of any that do a good job. So Kirk's raising his hands. He probably has an answer here. I do have you have a name for the tooling? Uh, VTune. You, VTune? Yeah, I knew VTune would do it, but it's like a pain in the butt to use. Ah, okay, so Solaris Sun Studio apparently has a profile that will do this as well. And, the, and it works on Linux also. Okay, that sounds like a good answer. I know that I, I spent a lot of work at Azul doing uh, performance monitoring and got uh, reasonably close to be figuring out where my cache resources were going and coming from. But I had to use the hardware performance counters. Uh, but I was mapping them back to the, to the Java level um, in, in a reasonable way. And VTune doesn't do that very well. Um, but that's the answer. You have to really get down to the hardware level performance counters to know that that's what's hitting you. So often it's the case that you can look, though, if you just do a sort of a your kit style prof, uh, profiler, look at what the hot code is and look at what it's touching. And then ask yourself, you know, here's some loop I'm spending a lot of time in. What's involved in the loop? And you'll find some hash table lookups and you'll find some indirections of going on. And if that's where all the time goes, you know, sort through that piece and simplify what has to be touched to get that job done, usually by flattening out some of the, the layers of indirection. Um, and life will go faster. Of branch mispredicts? Oh, backwards branches in the bottom of the loops. Yeah, I, okay, I'll talk about it. And the answer is this is not much. So, so um, branch predictors are are they, they've done a good job on on uh, on a lot of the styles of branches, and the backwards branch of the bottom of the loop is one that's sort of very easy to predict. So the the there's. It, it, that one doesn't typically cost you. Like a typical loop will have a, a modest trip count of 10, maybe, and that's fine. The prediction will do the right thing 
uh, for that kind of game. And if you have a very short trip count loop and you visit it inside another loop, pretty quickly an x86 will figure out that this branch goes you know, back, back, forward, back, back, forward, back, back, forward. He, he, he's pretty complicated in what he'll predict and does a good job there. I think backwards branches for loops are not actually an issue for prediction. Because, okay, it's a hotspot. Why loop and rolling? Because you, uh, you get another set of effects that are loop and rolling. What loop and rolling lets you do, typically you loop, okay, you're doing loop and rolling. It's you're having some walk through a large array. And the walk through large array is reading and writing a couple different arrays. When you unroll the loop, the loads and stores for those reads and writes also get unrolled and exposed to the compiler. They can get rescheduled. Then you can get multiple cache misses for the, the array to get started in parallel. So they'll do load, 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 load for you know, all the way down the, the, the set of arrays you're reading, and then store, 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 store at the bottom. All those load, 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 loads trigger off all your cache uh, missing loads all at once, and they overlap. So unrolling can often get you 2x, 4x, 10x speed ups, huge speed ups. That's why you do it. But it's to, it's, it's to, do, um, it's to do cache miss starting. So Hotspot JIT does that. Uh, and I have manually unrolled only when I'm doing uh, GPU style uh, deep learning kernels, like really tight, dense numerical kernels where I had to do the anti aliasing myself. And the, I knew the JIT wasn't going to anti alias. And then I did the loop unrolling so I could manually shuffle the loads around myself uh, against what the, you know, the JIT thought was legal uh, in order to get the cache misses to start up in parallel. So that was me doing a, a, essentially a video codec internal loop. It was, it was a deep learning inner loop, but it was the same, same kind of you know, tight, dense, small code. I did some horrible, evil hack at the Java layer to, to make it go fast. It seems that with hyper threading, uh, if you do deep, uh, long calculations, low I.O., yep. that the performance, uh, at least all the, uh, all the cores of the performance code cores drops, which is normal. And we also saw that we believe that so you're asking about hyper-threading. Um, that's the chip multi-threading I was talking about there. Yeah, and, and, and the answer there is sort of there's a limited number of, uh, of issue cycles available to those chip multi-threadings. And it's actually a single physical core that's doing the issuing. And the, the goal is to run two different unrelated threads of execution, so you can start the cache misses from the next to the next. But if you line them all up and have them all go, what really happens is the one guy cycles between them all. If they have no stall conditions, it didn't help. It's only useful if he bounces between the, the, the logical cores and this one stalled, so he let it go and start that memory, and then he bounced between these three till this one stalled and he's bouncing these two kind of thing, right? It, it didn't get any faster. If they were all running without any stalls, it didn't get any faster than having the one guy. Right, and, and that's the limit. So you, you typically have two, and he bounces between them. Um, if you have no memory stalls, it was no faster than having one. It's it's the count of hyper-threaded cores to actual cores. If you have no stalls, um, which you can arrange for various kinds of dense codecs and the like, also uh, single uh, linear scan striding memory accesses are well predicted by the x86 load store units, and they will prefetch them very aggressively. So if you're just walking down a big array, uh, you can you can more or less not have stalls for memory uh, until you run out of memory bandwidth. So you can also then run out of memory bandwidth, and then then, then you're stuck because you're trying to inhale too big of an array into your cores, and that's all the limit, that's all the faster it's going to go. Yeah? You were emphasizing about another, what's the mindset? Switch to another mindset. So now we uh, get into the non-deterministic non case. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so, so I, I gave some some hints that like think about your mindset, your programming mindset differently, um, and then where does the sort of the building blocks? So I don't have an answer there, and I don't think anyone does. A bunch of different people are trying different. This is this is all about what is a what is a good concurrent programming style, right? This is where do I find my parallelism? What's the right way to do it? So I know that um, some people have promoted strongly the notion of 
uh, shared immutable data. So closure, for instance, um, is all immutable data structures. And you do, you know, delta encoding. It's all done under the hood for you. To, so every time you do an apparently do a write, you're actually doing a, a delta change. And the old stuff's left immutable. And therefore, other cores can use it without having to do cache cache to cache and validate games. It's all just reads, if you will. Um, that's sort of good up to a point. Uh, another uh, coding style that I've been playing around with is implicit parallelism, where I have a, a large data parallel arrays, and the arrays might be actually very, very large, much larger than memory, um, and much larger than will fit on one machine. And, and the, the, you, you write to it as if it were uh, individual array operations. As a, as a building block, and then the array operation internally runs parallel. And that works for a different kind of coding style, right? This is where I have embarrassingly parallel data, um, but fairly complicated operations on it. But I still have a lot of data that can run in parallel. And so the coding style looks easy, but it only, ha you know, only works on a certain domain. So I don't know of any really awesomely good coding style for parallel execution. I, I, you know, parallel coding. I know that what Java hands out is sort of like parallel assembly building blocks. It's, you know, locks and blocks, synchronized, wait, notify, new thread, and it's not the level you want to be thinking at. You know, my, my parallel array hack lets me think about whole arrays as operations, and I'm doing math on them one after another, and there's a huge amount of parallelism under the hood. And if your domain looks like that, it works great, and if your domain doesn't, it didn't help you any. Right? And so you know, the, the closure coding style says, uh, because it's all immutable, I can have multiple threads. And then when you want to have threads communicate through memory, you have to very explicitly uh, talk about what is shared memory and what is not. And that gets into their refs, uh, you know, what is a shared variable. And that's you know, useful again, but you had to change your programming model a bunch. And you know, the other thing is that that shared immutability required a delta data structure encoding, which is a layer of indirection. And so closure code is, by design, much slower than the equivalent Java code because of that. And I say much, so, so 2x. And you can tweak it up or down. Scala has much the same issue. There's a way to make Scala try really hard to get down to the primitives without any indirection layers. But I've tried actually very hard on any modestized program that's not reliable that I get down to the fast version of Scala, although I tried actually quite hard for a while. Um, my, my plain old uh, Java code was always 2x faster than my Scala code, despite my best efforts to do all things you could do in Scala to make it go fast. And that was because of layers of indirection that just came out of the language by design. Um, there is a memory pressure. Well, OK, so, so memory, memory, the layers of indirection bite you in two ways. One is that the cache miss requires you to load, 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 and if you're missing, you have to wait till the next one shows up. You can't overlap those loads. The other one is that the layer of indirection typically burns up space in your caches. And because it's burning up space in your caches, your caches are half their size, effectively, because they got half their volume taken up by indirection wrapper layers that are not necessarily holding the, the meat of the data. Right? And that's, an that's another place where the 2x slowdown came from. No, no, that was the original intent. So the question was, like, does clearing final have any, have any meaning here? And the answer is final variables are not final from a hardware's point of view, right? That they, they exist, they can be read before they're initialized, so they have to read a zero. So the, the new operator, in fact, does store a zero down so that another thread, when you're reading it, will find the zero if it happens to read it before the final field gets set. There are a few cases where you can sidestep that, and you know the thing doesn't escape. But if, the, if the, during the construction of the object you escape it to global memory before you hit the final field, then you must write the zero, and then you write the final value. And from the hardware's point of view, it, it just changes. It went from zero to non-zero, and so there's no, nothing special happened there. Instead, what final can do is let you know that past the constructor, I'll get to you in just a second, past the constructor, it is not changing. So as a cost model in your head, you can think, this thing should sit in cache and be cacheable. Okay, that's, that's the first step. The next thing you do is you get rid of the getters and setters. Say, way well, everyone does getters and setters. No. So they're supposed to inline away, and they mostly do. And the answer, of course, is they mostly do. 
And when they don't, you don't know that, and you silently fail to inline a, a, a key, you know, key function call in a loop. And then the, you know, the whole un loop unrolling optimizations, the, but all those optimizations don't trigger if the loop has unknown function calls in them or is beyond a certain size. Every extra function call in a hot loop runs the risk of falling over the threshold of saying it's too big and I want inline now. So mostly getters and setters inline do the right thing, but not always. So if you're actually worried about performance, get rid of the get rid of the getter and setter in your hot loop. And then as soon as you get rid of the getter and setter in the hot loop, there's no point having it anywhere. I see he's like shaking head, no, no, no. Yes, I have done this multiple times. I will happily I will happily show you code where you're just wrong here, Kirk. So okay, so 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 he, his argument is one of good coding style, which I, I'm not going to argue against. Instead, I'm going to argue that if I need performance, I'll yank it. I'll yank it because it has bitten me on multiple occasions, and I know why it bites me. I understand the rules involved there. I also know that if I need to find out where a field gets set, my IDE will just tell me, and I don't need a getter or setter to find the places where it gets set. The IDE just knows, including my Emacs IDE, Blend IntelliJ, and every one of them. They all do it. Right? It's not an issue. <laughs> I have a particular coding style I've used for 40 years. It's highly performant. It's let me build all kinds of system level stuff the world uses all over and all kinds of domains, not just hotspot. And, and, and getters and setters are never part of it. And I, and I know exactly why I do it the way I do. And I'm happy to argue people. And I know a lot of people don't believe it that way. And if you want to, uh, we can go toe to toe on it at any time. So somebody over there had a question. Yeah, okay, so this is Erlang, which has this notion of the data being immutable and you know, uh, uh, a multi-threading model that's different. It's one of the more interesting multi-threading models. This is the actor model, and you're gonna actors talk to each other with like messages passing kind of things, where the message passing can actually be fairly cheap. Um, I'd say that Erlang's been around a long time, and for whatever reason, it hasn't stormed the world as the right way to write multiple threading code. So I, I don't know that it's the, the answer. That, you know, history tells us that it's not the best way to go, but there's definitely a, a, a subset of the program community that heads down that style, whether it's directly Erlang, or there's a Java version of Erlang, or if it's you know, the actor style coding, there, there, is, a, there is something there, um, but it's not storm the world as the right way to write parallel code. And I think it's because you have to change your head around a different coding style, and maybe you need some other performance hacks, but I know that the, the Erlang uh, code that I've seen, you know, looking at the performance of it, um, it's not necessarily as performant as you might think. Um, and th there are some levels of, there's some optimizations that are missing that would need to happen at a very low level to make it, that code actually go faster. Um, it's because the message passing style uh, has a cost to it that's, I have to write a bunch of things out and then I have to hand them off and that's a pass through memory to do the handoff. And I can get pretty cheap, but it's never free. And you know, if I'm hoping that my allocation was into cash only, and I filled it in cash only, and, and then I handed it cash to cash to the other guy who then read it out of cash, but it actually hits main memory a bunch, no matter what you do. And I can step you through why. And, that, and so the right answer now is that you have to have an optimization that understands how the actor model works in order to inline the actors into each other under the hood. And, and maybe there's a performance to be had there, but it's not currently there. And, and I don't know if that's the reason why Erlang, has, Erlang style hasn't taken off. But that is certainly an issue. OK, I'm basically out of time. So I need to free up the room and go find lunch. Um, but I'll be around here for a few more minutes if people want to ask me questions or talk about getters and setters. All right, bye. <laughs>